Now that we've taken some time to review some concepts from pre-calculus, we're ready to dive into our first real calculus concept. And that is the question of what are limits? First, we're going to take a look at the idea of a limit. And then we'll go into more about how we can actually find limits. So the idea of a limit here, if I consider a function f of x equals x squared minus 4 over x plus 2. And I wanted to graph this function. It might help to factor it. So it's x plus 2 times x minus 2 over x plus 2. And we know those x plus 2s are going to divide out. Now, when the x plus 2 divides out, that tells us there's actually a hole in the graph at x equals negative 2, where that thing that divides out uh, becomes a hole in the graph. So x plus 2 equals 0, subtracting 2. So if we were to make a graph of this, what's left is just x minus 2. And actually, let's extend the graph to the negative direction a little bit as well. This graph of x minus 2, the stuff that's left, has a y-intercept at negative 2 and a slope of rise 1, run 1. So it's going to keep doing that. But at negative 2, there's going to be a hole in the graph. So we end up with this graph, and there's a hole when x is equal to 2, negative 2. That hole we see has a y-coordinate of negative 4. What we see is if I zoomed in really close to that hole, we see the y value is getting really close to negative 4. And that's the idea of what we're calling the limit. What is that? What y value, what y coordinate is this graph or function getting really close to at a certain point? So at negative 2, the y value is close to negative 4. And notationally, how we write this is we will say the limit as x gets close to negative 2 of the function x squared minus 4 over x plus 2, the y value that that's getting close to is negative 4. Another way to think about the limit is it's the value of what should be there. even if it is not there. So looking at our graph in the green box, there should be a value, a y-coordinate of negative 4, even if there's not a point there. That's what a limit is. What should be there? What is it getting close to, even if it's not there? So keeping that definition in mind, we're going to see if we can find some limits. First, from a graph. So I'm going to make this graph 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. We're going to put a closed dot at 0, 1, an open dot at 1, 2, and a closed dot at 1, 4. Then at 3, 4, we'll put a closed dot, and we'll connect the graph to three of those four dots. Then we'll do an open dot at 3, negative 1, or 3, 2, and a closed dot at 4, 1, and maybe just connect the dots that way. 
we're going to first try and find the limit as x approaches 1 of the function. So when x is getting close to 1, what is the graph getting close to? Now we see at 1, the point is actually up here at 4. But we don't care what's actually happening at the point. We care what's happening close to the point. And if we look close to the point, we see close to the point there's a y-coordinate of 2. And so the limit as x is going to 1, we say is equal to 2. We could also find the limit as x approaches 4 of the function. And close to an x value of 4, we see that function is close to 1. This time, it turns out the point actually is there. And it doesn't matter if the point actually is there or not. Close to there, the y-coordinate is 1. We're just in that ballpark of the number 1. What's interesting, though, is if we take the look at the limit as x goes to 3 of the function. Because if we're looking at 3, when x is equal to 3, on the left side of 3, it's approaching what looks like a y value of 4. But on the right side of 3, it's approaching a y value of 2. For the limit to exist, it has to be approaching the same value on both sides. And because we have this jump in the graph, we're not approaching the same value on both sides. We say that the limit does not exist because it is not the same on both sides. So that's how we can pull a limit off of a graph. We look at what y-coordinate are we getting close to for a given x-coordinate. Another way we can find a limit is from a table. Let's look at what that would look like. Let's say we have the function f of x equals x squared minus x minus 6 over x minus 3. And we're looking for the limit as x gets close to 3 of f of x of the function. Well, the idea is we want to know what's happening close to 3. We don't really care what's happening at 3. So we could pick an x value that's close to 3, maybe 2.9. And we'll see what the function is getting close to. In fact, what we'll do is we'll pick even closer values, 2.99 and 2.999, and see what we're getting close to as we get closer and closer to 3. But remember, from the previous example, it has to be doing the same thing on both sides. So we're going to also pick x values on the other side of 3, maybe 3.1, and see what the function is looking at. Then we'll get closer, 3.01, and closer, 3.001. And the hope is the y values, the f of x's for both sides, are getting closer and closer to the same number. Let me show you a trick on the calculator to help us test this out. On the calculator, I'm going to go to the y equals button, clear out any function that might be in there, and then I'm going to type in the function we're working with. I need to put parentheses around the numerator, x squared minus x minus 6, close the parentheses, divided by, we need parentheses around the denominator, x minus 3, close the parentheses. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit second table, which is on the graph. This will allow me to pick values for x. And it will tell me what y is going to be equal to for those values. First, I'll delete out these from an old example. If you don't have the ability to type in the x values you want, hit second window, which is table set, and make sure the independent variable is set to ask. Then when you hit second table, you get to pick the x values. So we want to know what's happening at 2.9, 2.99, 2.99. Two point nine nine nine, 
And also what's happening on the other side at 3.1, 3.01, and 3.001. And what we see is this gives us y values that do seem to be going the same direction. The y values on the left were 4.9, 4.99, and 4.999. That seems like it's getting closer and closer to 5. The right side was doing the same, coming in from the other direction at 5.1, 5.01, and 5.001. It's also getting closer and closer to 5. And so because it's approaching the same thing on both sides, we can say the limit as x approaches 3 is equal to 5. Now, this table method is nice to get an idea of what's happening with the function near a value. The problem is it's a very inefficient method to go through, especially if the function starts to act really weird as we get closer and closer to a value. So we need a more algebraic way to try and get at the limit. And so we're going to find the limit from an equation. And the idea of finding the limit from an equation is we will plug the value in the function if possible. Or we'll use algebra. to make it possible. Here's what I mean by that. If we want to find the limit as x goes to 4 of the square root of 2x plus 8, x is getting close to 4. So let's just plug 4 into x to see what this is approaching. Plugging the 4 into x, we get the square root of 2 times 4 plus 8, which is the square root of 8 plus 8, or 16. And the square root of 16 is 4. And so by just plugging the number into the function, we can figure out what the limit would be at that point. The problem is it's not always as easy as just plugging in the number. Sometimes we're asked to do things like the limit as x goes to 3 of x squared minus x minus 6 over x minus 3. Notice this is the example up above that we just did with the table. The problem is, is if we try and plug that 3 in for the x's, what we'll end up with is 3 squared minus 3 minus 6 divided by 3 minus 3. Well, 3 squared is 9. Minus 3 minus 6 is 0. Divided by 3 minus 3 is 0. And we end up with 0 divided by 0, which is technically considered an indeterminate form. We can't divide 0 by 0. In fact, we can't divide anything by 0. So if we can't divide by 0, we need a different method to get at the solution. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say if the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus x minus 6 over x minus 3, what you might notice is that numerator factors. It factors to x minus 3 times x plus 2 over x minus 3. And now the x minus 3's divide out. When that happens, we now have the limit as x goes to 3 of just x plus 2. And now we can take that 3 and plug it in. Now we get 3 plus 2, which is 5, the same answer we found up above using the table method. So what we can try and do, as you can see, is remove that problem point or that undefined point by doing some algebra. In this case, we factored. In another case, we can try a different idea. The limit as x goes to 9 of the square root of x minus 3 over x minus 9. 
Notice if we were to plug 9 in, the denominator would become 0. So with the numerator, we get 0 divided by 0. So instead, we're going to employ a different trick that we can steal from our pre-calculus days, is whenever we have a square root and a fraction, we know we can clear that square root by multiplying top and bottom by the conjugate where we change the sign in the middle. So we're going to multiply top and bottom by the square root of x plus 3, because now we'll have the limit as x goes to 9 of squaring the first part, we end up with x, minus squaring the bottom part is 9, times an x minus 9, times the square root of x plus 3. And look what that allows us to do. It allows us to remove the x minus 9 discontinuity. Now be careful. If there's nothing left in the numerator, we know that the numerator still has 1 in it. So we have the limit as x goes to 9 of 1 over the square root of x plus 3. And now that we've removed the problem point, we remove the thing that makes the denominator 0, we can plug 9 into that square root. And so we have 1 over the square root of 9 plus 3. The square root of 9 is 3, plus 3 is 6. And we end up with 1 sixth for our solution. These methods of using algebra to find the limits are very important to our future study of calculus. And I really enjoy our textbook for many reasons. But this is one area where the textbook does not give many good examples. So we'll do probably a few of these in class to really get used to using algebra to find the limit, to remove the point that becomes undefined. But that's how we can find limits with algebra much more effective than a table. The last type of limit that we're going to find then is finding limits at infinity. Specifically, we're going to be interested in the limit as x goes to infinity of some function. And usually, that function is going to be a rational function. So let me start by giving some hints about things we know. First is we know the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x to any exponent. The graph of this turns out to be something like this. And what we notice is as the x's get closer and closer to infinity, the y coordinates get closer and closer to 0 at that horizontal asymptote. So we will say that the limit as x goes to infinity of x 1 over x to the n is 0. Another important hint is the limit as x goes to infinity of just x to the n. If we were to graph this example, x to the n is going to ultimately be something. It's going to wiggle somehow. But as x goes to infinity, y also is going off to infinity, which technically is not a number. So we're going to say that does not exist. But the limit as x goes to infinity of a quotient of functions turns out to be the limit as x goes to infinity of the largest power term of the top divided by the largest power term of the bottom. This will make more sense when we do a couple examples. So let's try a few. Let's do the limit as x goes to infinity of 3x to the fifth plus 2x to the fourth minus 6x divided by 4x cubed plus 2x plus 1. Now, as x gets really, really large, 
each individual term is also going to get larger and larger. And what turns out happening is the biggest power term in the numerator, 3x to the fifth, ends up taking over because it's so much larger than the others. Similarly, in the denominator, the largest power is x cubed. So the 4x cubed ends up taking over. And so what ends up happening is all the rest of the stuff becomes inconsequential. And we're just left with the limit as x goes to infinity of 3x to the fifth over 4x cubed, which is, if I reduce the x's, the limit as x goes to infinity of 3 fourths times x squared. But we know x squared, that's going to go to infinity. It's ultimately going to get huge as x gets huge. And so for our final answer, we're going to say this whole thing goes to infinity, or more accurately, does not exist. There is no limit. It's not approaching any number. It's just going to grow forever without bound. What if I wanted the limit as x goes to infinity of 5x squared minus 4x plus 1 over 3x to the fifth plus 2x squared minus 1? Well, again, we look at who's going to take over on top and bottom. The largest power term takes over as the values get huge, which is 5x squared on top and 3x to the fifth on the bottom. So we end up with the limit as x goes to infinity of 5x squared over 3x to the fifth, which is going to reduce to 5 over 3x cubed. This time, you notice the x cubed is in the denominator. That's the first hint. When the x to the n is in the denominator, we're basically taking 5 divided by a huge number that's going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. When we take 5 and divide by a huge number, there's basically nothing left. When there's nothing left, we say then that equals 0. One more case to consider then. Let's look at the limit as x goes to infinity of 4x cubed minus 6x minus 7 over 8x cubed plus 2x squared minus 1. Again, like last time, the largest term in the numerator and the denominator takes over, the largest exponent. Everything else basically goes away, and we have the limit as x goes to infinity of 4x cubed over 8x cubed. And that is going to reduce out. So we have the limit as x goes to infinity. The x is dividing out. 4 eighths reduces to 1 half, which has no x's left in it. If there's no x's left in it, we're just going to be left with 1 half off at infinity. And so we end up with a horizontal asymptote, in this case, at 1 half. So that's your introduction to limits, the idea of what a limit is, what should be there, even if it's not there, or what y value are we getting closer and closer to on the graph. You should be able to find limits from a graph, from a table, using algebra, and also at infinity. So practice some of these on your own. We'll discuss them more in class and look at some applications. We'll see you then.